nutritionist. I am a mother of two grown children, grandmother of one lovely energetic eight-year-old, um, studied at the Institute of Holistic Nutrition in Mississauga. Um, part of being a registered nutritionist is continuing education. So I do at least 25 hours of continuing ed every year. Uh, February being heart and stroke month, we felt like it made sense to talk about heart disease and how to mitigate your risk, how to deal with that. Well, one more. So we'll talk about some of those things, how to lower your risk when we're hearing things about cholesterol and hearing things about blood pressure, we'll wade through some of that and I'll try and get everybody on the right track. You would have received in your email, I feel like we are looking sideways, this lovely checklist, a uh, healthy hearts questionnaire. We will go through that at the end. Hopefully you'll understand kind of the scoring and how it all works uh, by the end. Now, has everybody had a chance to see that? Um, I'll hope so, some thumbs up. And why? We always wanna know the why, what are we working for? Uh, this one is kind of shocking. So 50% of people who have a heart attack, their first symptom is death. That's tremendous. And it's not something that we hear a lot about. Other shocking facts. 77% of people who suffer a heart attack have normal cholesterol levels. In 2012, 1.6 million Canadians were reported as having heart disease. And every seven minutes, someone in Canada dies from a heart disease related death or stroke. It is the second leading cause of death in Canada. In 2012, it was 48,000 lives. Uh, 2019, that was up over 70,000. So we're not making a whole lot of headway with this education. So stress tests and echocardiograms and that sort of thing can only find existing issues or prior heart attacks. They cannot see the future. So we wanna do those things now to help mitigate our risk so that we don't end up down that road. So knowing your risk. Uh, risk factors that you cannot control. So age and family history. And my formatting has lost us the things you can control. You gotta love it. So what can you control? Let me see. You can control things like smoking and vaping. We'll go through all of these on a separate slide. Uh, lack of exercise, unhealthy diet, obesity or overweight even, blood sugar imbalances, inflammation, high blood pressure, stress, chronic infections. So these are all things that we can control. Ta-da, we love it. So can't control family history, we come from where we come from, can't control your age, you were born when you were born, and there's X number of times since then, but the rest of it, and this is 70, 80, 90% of the risk comes from those things that you do have control over. Things like smoking. So we know it's not good for us. It is the heart attack risk, two times heart attack risk with smoking, and increased risk of death after a heart attack. And part of that is the free radicals, those unstable particles that create abnormal cells, and these create damage in the arteries, and then repair has to take place. And you know how swelling takes place when you have any kind of an injury, that will narrow those arteries, it's going to raise blood pressure, and blood pressure is another risk factor. 
It also decreases your exercise tolerance. Smokers are not big joggers most of the time. So you exercise less and then you have an increased tendency for a lot of those other factors. Uh, increases the tendency to have blood clots. So even light or intermittent smoking. So some people will say, I only smoke, you know, two or three cigarettes a day. One to four cigarettes is still a two and a half to threefold risk of heart disease. It really is a zero sum that we're after. Uh, heart disease in smokers, it's three times more likely that a smoker will die from heart disease rather than lung cancer. And that secondhand smoke increases that risk by about 25%. Uh, trying to gauge the demographic here. I know many of these ladies. So if we're looking at those under 35, so these are likely many of your children, uh, number one cause of heart disease. So we wanna make that known. And e-cigarettes and vaping in the studies that have looked at that really do not appear to be significantly safer. The good news is that a risk of heart attack is greatly reduced even in that first year of quitting smoking. So we wanna be at least thankful for that piece of it, that if you quit, it really does help. The lack of exercise. So 20 minutes of daily moderate exercise. So we don't have to be CrossFit enthusiasts to get that benefit. It is a physical activity that's beneficial for blood pressure, for cholesterol levels. Those are those blood lipid levels people talk about. Helps with clotting factor health, helps with the health of those vessels. Just that pulse that gets things stretching and exercising is good. It does lower inflammation over time. And studies will show that 150 minutes, that's two and a half hours of physical activity and that's moderate physical activity can be beneficial. If you're a vigorous exerciser, it takes even less to reduce that risk by about 30%. That is as easy as that 20 minute walk after dinner. And it's that all or nothing mentality. We don't wanna get stuck in thinking that oh, I can't do enough. If you have 10 minutes, take 10 minutes. If you're sitting at a desk all day, stand for a little bit. It's the little pieces that add up over time. You can start small. You can walk around the block. The malls are open. You can walk around the mall finally, or the farmer's market. You might even get some sunshine and some good food choices at the same time. So we want to move where we can to decrease that risk. And that's what it's all about. This low fat, high carb diet that was all the rage and people still talk about it this quote from the American College of Cardiology, may well have played an unintended role in the current epidemic of obesity, lipid abnormalities, type two diabetes, and metabolic syndromes. This is insulin resistance and leptin resistance is another big one. So we wanna be mindful that this myth, and we'll talk about that, is really, playing havoc on people. Where are we going? My goodness. So the researcher, Dr. Youssef, did another study in the UK and his research team actually found that the higher carb increase, the higher risk of heart disease. That correlation was very strong. And so diet, what's going on there? Things that we want to increase, things like vegetables, nuts and seeds, fish and poultry, fruit, actual water, a moderate intake of red meat and beans and lentils, things that we want to reduce, things like sugars and grains and alcohol and caffeine. So what is going on with all of this? So something that I learned more recently is that in many medical schools, those schools will dedicate less than 25 hours to the subject of nutrition. 
which is huge to me because many doctors are handing out nutritional advice. So we want to go with someone that spent more than two or three days, perhaps looking at nutrition to get some solid nutrition advice. Using pharmaceuticals, and that is often what happens when people go in to the doctor and they're having symptoms of high blood pressure or things like that, they'll want to take a pharmaceutical to help change that high blood pressure and get it more in range. That's helpful. But if you're not getting at the root cause, it's a lot like mopping up that floor while the sink is overflowing. So the diet really does make a difference. We want to get at that. Um, we talk about medicine being a slow form of poison a lot of the time. Each eating opportunity that you have is an opportunity to either feed your body something healthy or feed it something that is going to cause inflammation and disease down the road. But it's hard to know what is a healthy diet. All of these mixed messages come through. So people that I will follow, Dr. Terry Walls is a physician who has had a recovery from multiple sclerosis. She was wheelchair bound in a re reclined wheelchair uh, and is now walking and bike riding and giving talks at conferences um, with diet primarily. And Dr. Jack Wolfson is a cardiologist. One of the first things that he does with his patients is he puts them on a very intense paleo diet. Dr. Um, Mark Menelisino is another one that I've followed a lot of his work. I have a couple of his books as well, one on heart health specifically in women and how there is a lot of different uh, signs and symptoms as well. And we'll talk about that later. The reason for the increasing vegetables, number one, they're a source of fiber. They are gonna help bind to some of those excess cholesterols and get them out of the body. Those leafy greens and sea vegetables are amazing sources of antioxidants. They're going to help protect against that free radical damage we talked about with smoking. There's a lot of free radicals that are out in your environment. You're walking next to traffic. You've got cast iron pans that may be off gassing. We want to pay attention to all of our environmental toxins as well and help that fiber binds it, gets them out of the system. Things like tomatoes we hear being protective of heart. It's the lycopene, so it's raw tomatoes. It's that gooey stuff around the seeds of the tomato that really contains the heart protective aspect. And five or more, more servings of fruits and vegetables daily is the recommendation. Variety really is key. There was one recent study that showed eating at least 30 different plant-based foods a week had a very significant impact of the health of the microbiome. This is your gut health. We talk about all disease begins in the gut. That's what we're talking about. Our healthy bacteria that can grow in there. That gut brain connection is huge as well. Uh, we mentioned things like fish and poultry. Fish, especially oily fish like salmon are a great source of omega-3s. Recommend trying to eat fish at least twice a week. Smaller fish even like anchovies or sardines can be really economical. Uh, and then eliminating those trans fats. So that's a big one as well. They are inflammatory. They will cause, they're very easily damaged as well. Things like canola oil or soybean oil or cotton seed oil. Cotton is not a food crop. It is a textile crop. We're making clothes from this. There are very different rules for how it can be grown. And then we eat those cotton seed oil byproducts basically. So easily damaged by heat, by light, by air and increasing inflammation due to that instability that happens. We want to make sure we're cleaning up the diet of some of those things as well. A little bit of controversy about olive oil being heated or not being heated. The information that I have at my hands, a couple of good presenters that I've seen in the past talking about good fats and what does that mean. Talk about olive oil being healthy as long as you're only heating it once. So if you're cooking a roast in the oven and you want to put a little bit of olive oil on it, absolutely. If you're going to deep fry over and over, 
not your best choice. Uh, using something like coconut oil or butter or ghee, if you have issues with some of the dairy proteins can be really helpful. And the myth busting end of cholesterol. This is questionable science at best. Cholesterol is necessary for optimal health. 85% of cholesterol is made in the body. It's not dietary intake, it's something your body's making. So why in the world would your body make something that was unhealthy? We need it. It is the raw material for human hormones, especially sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, your stress hormones like cortisol. That cortisol will help with electrolyte balance as well. Um, it's kidney supportive. We also make vitamin D from cholesterol just beneath the surface of the skin when the sun gets a little bit nicer in a couple of months. Vitamin D is immune supportive. We've been hearing all about that the last little while. Also helps protect in the cardiovascular system and cancer preventative as well. And a lot of studies will show that correlation. It's also used for digestion. So we need cholesterol to make bile salts so that we can digest fats and oils and get those fat soluble vitamins digested like vitamin D and vitamin E and vitamin A. So that cholesterol collects in the arteries sometimes and it gets that label of being a problem. The problem for most people is blood sugar imbalance. If we think about the properties of fat, when do we use fat? We use fat before we fry our eggs in a pan. It's slippery, it keeps things from sticking. And a healthy fat, that's exactly how it behaves. It's slippery, things move around. Something sticky that we use a lot of the time is sugar. So sugar is microscopically abrasive. So it gets in the arteries, it's gonna cause those micro abrasions within the vessel. And then cholesterol needs to be created to come along and patch that up so that the vessel can heal beneath the cholesterol. The issue is when we get those abrasions and abrasions and abrasions over time, we need to create more and more cholesterol to calm that down. One of the best ways I'll say after May to help manage high cholesterol, perhaps it's more cholesterol than your doctor likes to see. One of the best ways you can do that is just getting yourself out in the sun. Put your body out in the sun for 10 minutes at a healthy time. We don't wanna get a sunburn because that has its own problems. Um, but getting rid of that cholesterol by making protective vitamin D can be really helpful and then reducing or eliminating sugar. So sugar by last count went by something like 60 different names. Maybe it's closer to hundred now, given what they're doing to it. Refined sugar, things like cane sugar, corn sugar, beet sugar, anything that ends in O's like sucrose, glucose, anything that ends in all, things like sorbitol and mannitol, those are sugars that are going to affect blood sugar. They're abrasive like that sandpaper even things like grains, even healthy whole grains. As soon as you chew them, those grains become sugar. There's a quote, uh, Dr. Mark Hyman in Fed Up talks about, you can have a bowl of cornflakes with no added sugar, or you can have a bowl of sugar with no added cornflakes. At a metabolic level, this is the same breakfast. So we wanna make sure if we are doing things like oatmeal, we're doing steel cut oats or a large flake oat that's gonna have more fiber. It's not the instant oat that's gonna instantly also raise the blood sugar and pairing something like that with a fat. So some coconut butter or some walnuts are really gonna help slow and low that blood sugar release. Some of these grains also will contain indigestible compounds. We talk about lectins. And this was a big story when the Plant Paradox book came out several years ago. People were worried about lectins in their food because they are generally inflammatory. And they also can trigger autoimmune issues, especially with overconsumption um, through molecular mimicry. So anything that is spiking insulin is also spiking fat storage. We want to 
watch that blood sugar so that we can improve that fat burning in the body and also helping with protein digestion. So instead of inhibiting protein breakdown, we're gonna help break down those proteins by balancing that blood sugar and keeping the enzymes balanced. Grains also contain phytates. So phytates, similarly, they will bind, but they bind to nutrients. And if they're bound to a nutrient, your body can't absorb it and use it. So it's effectively stealing those nutrients out of your digestive system. This makes expensive stool. This does not help nourish your body. And that is not our goal most of the time. We are trying to nourish our actual self. Overweight and obesity feels like we stopped tracking this. We know, we know this is the way it's going. You are not alone if you are struggling with weight and letting go of that weight. You can see this in the map. It's really not changing, but this extra weight, especially for people that are apple shaped, they carry it kind of around their middle can be even more heart unhealthy. This puts a strain on the body. It is a sign of pre-diabetes or blood sugar dysregulation, uh, does increase your risk of high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And also it tends to make people a little less active. So you don't feel like moving around quite so much when you have a lot of weight to haul around, but it is often just a symptom of other dysregulation in the body. So blood sugar balance, is essential for hormone balance. We think about thyroid hormones is a big one that impacts women. The thyroid hormones will run metabolism. They run some of the adrenal hormones will Im be impacted by thyroid. And all of that balance has to start with that blood sugar balance piece. We want to even out the big stuff so the little stuff can follow behind. And blood sugar imbalance, well, sugar's everywhere. We look at how the general public, we talk about the standard American diet some of the time, having coffee with sugar. We the famous double-double, things like cereal and pancakes and muffins and juice and pasta and pizza and chips and oh, it's everywhere. We really do have to make a conscious choice to see where we can cut these things out. It's things like the pasta. Yes, it's a grain. Maybe you're going to do some zoodles, uh, zucchini noodles and get rid of the starch that way, but you have to pay attention to the label on the sauce as well and make sure there's not added sugar. Being mindful that tomatoes are relatively high in sugar. So bulking that up with some vegetables. Diets that are high in refined sugars really do increase the amount of insulin resistance that happens within the body and leptin resistance. This leptin is the chemical in the body that tells yourself that you are full. You don't need any more. It doesn't send when leptin can get into the cells. It tells your body it's enough. We don't need to head back to the kitchen for a second helping. If we make sure that we add fats and protein, things like if you're gonna have an apple, having that sun butter to dip it in, or you're having vegetables, carrot sticks, making sure you have those with hummus or guacamole so that you get that long, slow release of nutrients through your food. Like, where are we going? And inflammation is another one. General inflammation, the first thing I think about with inflammation after blood sugar balance is food sensitivity. Perhaps it's because I'm sensitized to that because I work with it all day, but I know that most people have some kind of underlying food sensitivity. Maybe it's not an allergy. It's not going to send you into the ER with anaphylaxis, but it's something that can trigger your body's white blood cells to activate. They active, they get in there, and then they cause all kinds of chemical messengers to begin. So we'll see that inflammation, we talked cytokines, that was the big news of cytokine storm with the new virus. And that has an effect generally of inflammation and swelling and irritation through that whole system. 
water retention. It's going to cause pain and the smooth muscles often become irritated as well. They're maybe spasmy and things like that. And high blood pressure, why do we care? Well, the normal blood pressure, so when we talk about 120 over 80, that is the pressure, the 120 is the pressure of the blood vessel when the heart is actively beating. And then the other end of things, diastolic pressure, when the heart is relaxed, that between beats. Normal blood pressure, then hypertension. So it's kind of in that pre stage as well. And then high blood pressure when it gets up over 140 over 90 consistently, this really does cause a lot of stress on the vessel itself. Hypertension or high blood pressure is a risk factor for coronary artery disease. It is the single most important factor for stroke as well, it causes about half of ischemic strokes and also increases the risk of the hemorrhagic strokes where there would be bleeding. And this is because of that increased pressure within the walls of the vessel itself. It's a stressor. You think about if you had an elastic band that you're stretching constantly it's gonna cause weakness and damage and even clogs. Those repeated repairs of those micro abrasions can be tricky. Some of the things that can impact that as well, we look about high blood pressure. There are a lot of ways to do it, to take a, high, a blood pressure reading poorly. So making sure that you don't have white coat syndrome, they call it, where when the doctor comes in the room, your blood pressure automatically goes up. That is not a great way to see what your blood pressure is doing. Making sure that the doctor's using the right size of cuff so that you're not being squeezed and in pain. Pain's going to increase that blood pressure. Make sure that you've been sitting and resting for three to five minutes before you take that reading. You shouldn't be rushing from the parking lot to get to the doctor's office to get rushed into the room. This can raise blood pressure. Don't be thinking about stressful thoughts, hopefully. It's a doctor's office. We're not usually there for happy reasons, but try and keep your mind on something. Uh, make sure that you haven't had coffee or cigarette within about 30 minutes of that blood pressure reading. That's going to increase the reading. Make sure you're warm enough. Doctor's offices are notorious for being chilly. So that your body is going to increase blood pressure to try and warm you. It's going to get your blood pumping. Make sure you go to the bathroom. Even a full bladder can raise that systolic pressure five to 10 points. Diet, we talked about, definitely impacts cardiovascular disease risk, but diet intervention can lower blood pressure as well. There is a study that showed four ribs of celery, so not whole celery, but four ribs of celery, can reduce blood pressure by almost 12%. So that can be the difference from that hypertension to a normal blood pressure. And celery is pretty cost effective and something that you can get your hands on fairly readily and stress. This feels like a very bad news presentation. Uh, stress will provoke physiological changes within the body. So if we are thinking within our own body that we're running from some virtual saber tooth tiger, maybe it's traffic, maybe it's deadlines, maybe it's trying to homeschool and work from home at the same time, this is gonna increase blood flow through that system into your core so that you could run away from this system if only you could. Uh, increasing that heart rate so that you have good circulating oxygen so you can actually think and move at the same time. Increase blood glucose levels. This is a stress response. You want to have available energy so you can run away from this problem. So blood coagulation. So if you are running from a saber-toothed tiger and it bites you, you want to be able to form some good clots. So we'll see coagulation disorders, blood clotting disorders in people with chronic stress. So this works well for acute stress. If you did have to run from a burning building, perhaps, that physiological response will help you get where you're going faster. But a lot of us live in a constant state of stress. It's always something. And this 
is what causes the damage over time. So we want to think about ways to manage that stress. If there are things within our control that we can manage, absolutely deal with them. Things like healthy ways of dealing with them, like mindfulness and getting adequate sleep and eating healthier, getting some exercise are healthy ways instead of doing some of those other numbing activities like watching too much television or eating too much food, over scheduling to stop yourself from thinking about all your other stresses, making sure that you are dealing with your stress in a healthy way. Mental health right now is fragile for a lot of people. So if you need to talk to someone, reach out and talk to a professional. Maybe you don't need a professional. Maybe you just need to vent to a girlfriend or a coworker that you trust. Finding an outlet for some of that stress is important. Chronic infection is another. I had a colleague ask the other day, why do I have this client on this crazy amount of vitamin C and they still aren't having any bowel tolerance issues? And it has to do with chronic infection a lot of the time. Um, she let me know later that he was waiting on a tooth being extracted now that the pandemic had calmed down so he could have it removed. It feels like that's maybe was an emergency that could have been dealt with during pandemic times, but some people are more comfortable, but yes, that definitely will impact bowel tolerance. Things like root canals where there won't be pain, the nerve is dead, but there may be an issue still below the surface. Periodontal disease is quite common and a huge risk factor as well. Correlation with periodontal disease and heart disease. Dysbiosis we talked about as well. We want to feed those good guys, those fibers. We want to have a healthy microbiome. Other things like chronic Epstein-Barr or reactivated Epstein-Barr or even Lyme. I think we'll learn very soon that Lyme is much more commonplace than we were led to believe. Signs of heart attack. So I don't think we have any men currently on the call. There are a few that signed up. We hear a lot about heart disease and heart attack in men. It's very different if you are a woman, it doesn't feel the same. And a woman will die of heart disease in Canada every 20 minutes because in large part, the early signs of that impending heart attack are missed almost 80% of the time. Most two thirds of the heart disease clinical research is still focused on men. Women are five times more likely to die of heart disease than breast cancer. Women are more likely than men to die or have a second heart attack in rapid succession of their first cardiac event. This is under-researched, under-diagnosed, under-treated, and we as women are often under-aware. So we wanna be aware of what that looks like thinking about things like chest pressure. It's not typically pain for women. It's pressure, like an elephant is sitting on your chest. Fatigue, it's a tricky one because it's so common and it is often brushed off with, you know, you have new children and you have new responsibilities and now you have all of this homeschooling and working from home to deal with. This will cause fatigue in a normal person, but if it's unusual fatigue, it's not easy to chalk it up to those other things. You did get a good night's sleep, or maybe you didn't. Maybe you have all of a sudden unexplained anxiety or unexplained sleep disturbance. You didn't have coffee, you did your walk, you should have had a good night's sleep and you simply can't. Uh, jaw pain, neck pain, back pain, being aware of things that are out of the ordinary. Nausea, stomach discomfort is common across both spectrums. Um, two people quite close to me at the time, one passed away. He got up in the night to get some Tums. He had diabetes, which is blood sugar dysregulation. It's a risk factor, but it was never really assessed that way. And that was his first cardiac event and he passed. The other uh, went to the doctor because he didn't feel well. He thought he had the flu just felt crummy and the doctor said you know go home rest have some chicken soup you'll be fine and his wife made him some chicken soup and he didn't live to eat it 
So we have to be aware of, you know, you know your body, press for these things. If you feel like it's unusual, it's not normal, seek that help. Because you're worth it, because you matter. I want to take good care of you. The other technology that, because I care about you and I care about heart health, I was invited to do some training on a digital pulse wave analysis uh, machine. It just hooks up to your finger like they do at the hospital. They put the little clip on and the little red light is flashing in there. And it is something that's a little more preventative which I like. It uses that infrared sensor and it has a look at what's going on with hemoglobin, what's going on with the pulse rate, the pulse height. And it really can give us a sense of what's going on. So we have early detection and prevention that's going to ultimately assist and decrease your risk and some of the financial costs that are placed on that healthcare industry. The DPA, the digital pulse analysis, will look for arterial wall stiffness. It looks at those arteries in under three minutes. It also is non-invasive, which is nice. We don't have to go for any crazy radiologic tests and we can look at changes in pressure and blood flow and the velocity of the blood, how it's moving through those vessels, through that whole pulse wave and see what's going on. Then there's a lovely little report that's generated where we can look at where things are out of whack and then use that information to pinpoint therapies. Maybe you just need to deal with stress and everything else is lovely. Maybe it is diet. Maybe it's, there's, you can see the little triangles near the bottom. This is talking about cortisol and that uh, fight or flight response being a little more activated. But having that information and knowing where those chinks in your armor might be really does give you a sense of where do I need support? Are things too stiff? Could there be potential calcifications that are going on? We can look at therapies that would help with that so that you really can take control of your risk. If you're doing all the other things right, what do we need to do to turn back the clock on some of the things that have gone wrong in the interim, giving you that power? I said that we would talk about this lovely handout as well and i definitely wanted to have time for questions from you folks if you wanted to get into the um, q a screen or whatnot i'm happy to answer questions if it feels more private you can reach out to me um, here at verdure with the email or at extension 5 on the phone i'm happy to take a few minutes at, over the weekend to touch base with people as well while you're pondering your questions, you may have noticed a pattern forming when you were going through that Healthy Hearts questionnaire. So things like exercise. Do you exercise less than 20 minutes a day? Hopefully that answer is no. Do you smoke? The correct answer is no. Are you exposed to secondhand smoke? Oh, Marilyn. That answer would be no. We're looking for do you work with hazardous pesticides or cleaners or solvents or exposed to exhaust? You're a bus driver. We want to know these things. Maybe if the answer is yes, then what do we need to do to help the body deal with that stressor? Conventional cleaners and personal care products are another one. These are toxins that we're exposed to that if we can make some better choices, maybe we're going to use our Woolsies instead of our bounce unstoppables, downy unstoppables whatever. These things put less stress on the liver, less inflammation within the body. And we're better able to handle everything else that's going on. I know Dr. Kristen will often talk about the barrel effect. So your body is a barrel. If you are doing lots of good things right, you might have a little more room in the barrel to deal with these things. If you're not, then perhaps you want to make some changes so that your barrel does have room to deal with things that you can't control. You have a job, you have to pay the bills, that's what's going to happen. We want to make better choices in other areas. Uh, major life changes, not something that you have a lot of control over a lot of the time. Um, 
the last year, I think we've all had a little bit less control. Um, meditation and mindfulness. Um, book recommendation. It's my favorite. Uh, one of my favorite books on meditation is called 10% Happier. You may recognize parts of the story. The fellow that wrote it was a newscaster who had a terrible panic attack on live TV. And his journey to discover how meditation really could help him was very beneficial. And it was a very helpful read. One of the things that I've taken away from that is to try and meditate every day, uh, make it doable. So I tell myself that I'm going to meditate for at least one minute a day and people will scoff and they will say like one minute, what difference is one minute going to make? But it's the consistency that's built in and nine times out of 10, if I get myself situated and I'm going to meditate for one minute, it's going to be 10 or 15. Uh, the joke is often if you don't have 10 minutes to meditate, take an hour. You're the person who needs to meditate. And it's not about not thinking. It's about accepting the thought and moving on. And he really does a great job of explaining some of that because people get stuck in, I can't meditate. Maybe you meditate because you're jogging and you just get concentrating on the thrum of your feet. Maybe you're a cooking kind of a meditator and you can just stir dinner for the family and not think. It doesn't have to look like that ohm cross-legged. But mindfulness. Um, sleep. I have a whole nother hour on sleep, but it really is important. Sleep deprivation. So six or fewer hours, three or more nights a week. I think it was a 2015 study that looked at KW area and about 86% of people responded, yes, they were sleeping six or fewer hours, three or more nights a week. And that is the people you're on the road with. These are the people who are out in the world, in your neighborhood. Um, pain, and we talked about the pain of the blood pressure cuff, increasing blood pressure, chronic pain. So things like fibromyalgia, we wanna do the things that can get that under control the best we can. Questions about dietary cholesterol and does it raise blood cholesterol? I'm gonna go with no, not most of the time. There is a small subsection of people who do have a genetic predisposition to have a greater impact of that dietary cholesterol on the body. Most people are not those people. Those people know who they are. Um, dietary cholesterol, is not the enemy. Eggs are not the enemy. Fats are not the enemy. Your body needs fat. Your brain is made of fat. Your eyeballs are made with fat. Every single cell in your body has a lipid membrane. Lipids are fat. So we need those. Does it raise blood cholesterol? I'm going to go with sugar is the correlation there. If your blood sugar is dysregulated, it is going to impact your blood cholesterol. I have had several clients who have been able to go off of or lower cholesterol medications over time when we get that blood sugar balanced. People who were perhaps pre-diabetic as well that have been able to manage their blood sugar with diet and exercise and perhaps some mindfulness we want to think about you as a whole person. Nothing is just one thing. We can't concentrate on diet and not worry about the rest of the big picture. It's holistic. Hopefully that answered some of the things you were looking for there. Uh, we talked about blood sugar. So we want to say, no, I don't have blood sugar issues or cravings or low energy within an hour of eating. That's going to be a sign that you have blood sugar issues. If you have a nice dinner and then in 20 minutes, you're like, oh, I need something sweet to be finished. You probably had too many carbs or not enough fat and protein with your dinner. So paying attention to those things. Eating fried food. Fried food is not going to be healthy. It shouldn't be more than a once in a while thing. Sweets or cakes. Um, we talked about the Bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, corn. People forget corn's a grain. It's not a vegetable. It's a grain. It's starchy. As soon as you chew a starch, it's a complex carbohydrate. So it's got all these little simple sugars stacked together and you chew it and you break those all up. 
being mindful of added sugars, being watching your diet for wild caught, well-raised fish, trying to do that at least a couple of times a week, getting some fruit in, getting some actual vegetables in, a green food, not ketchup and pasta sauce, but maybe spinach or kale or broccoli or an asparagus and try and go out on a limb. Uh, when I was doing childcare, we would often try and have one weird food a week, something that no one had ever had. So dragon fruit or star fruit or whatever, gooseberries, just to get something different on the palate and expand that palate. We know that we can't like everything we try the first time, but if you have it once or twice and then the next time you try it, it could be a favorite. Uh, coffee is another one. It will raise blood pressure and that causes issues. One or two cups a day, you can probably get away with if you're drinking enough water. Soft drinks, fountain drinks. Some people are much more sensitive to the carbonation, even as much as the sugars and the caffeines in some of the colas. But even that carbonation can cause a whole host of problems. Uh, and then do you drink less than six cups of water a day? I had my lovely Beckman Gelly book out earlier today and uh, talking about you're not sick, you're thirsty. Uh, so many things in the body depend on water. We talk about the body being 70% water. So your brain, your joints, your skin, bile needs water, your stomach acid needs water, all of these things to move your blood, your lymph, to keep your immune system functioning. You wanna have your lymph pumping smoothly and getting rid of all that garbage and detritus. So if you're looking at that, you want to have all of those answers being no. If you're looking at that and there are a few that have swung over into the yes column and you're looking for help with substitutions or you want more information about how that's gonna impact you, you can reach out to anybody really here at Verdure or you can reach me at the Divine Clinic as well. I'm there a few days a month. We have the DPA system going right now. There's a couple of promo days here in Waterloo, another couple of days in Brantford. So definitely if you have concerns, you have someone in your life that you're like, oh, they really should have that test. Book it, get it done, find out what is going on so that you can get in front of that before it turns into an issue. Uh, did we have other questions out there? Ah, oh, sleep. Well, sleep is a big one because we talk about that sleep dysfunction or six or fewer hours. And we have to think about, is it trouble falling asleep? Is it trouble staying asleep? Is it trouble feeling awake when you do wake up? Maybe you fall asleep great, you don't wake up, but you feel like you didn't sleep at all. All of these things are kind of pointing in the direction of what's going on. If you wake up at a specific time all the time, people will often say, I wake up between two and three every night. What's going on? Many people, that's blood sugar, it's liver, it's things like that, that we want to pay attention to what's going on there because it's root it's a symptom. A lot of these things are a symptom. We Blood pressure is not a problem. It's a symptom. What's going on behind that is what we really want to look at. We want to deal with the root, not the outward expression of what's going on. Alrighty, my friends. Well, I will thank everyone for their time and I appreciate you being here. There will be a replay that goes out early next week, I believe, once Holly gets everything all tidied up and we see what's going on. Uh, the other, you will have a menu plan that arrives as well with some breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner ideas that'll be heart protective, heart healthy, help you get those vegetables in, maybe stretch the palate a little bit. Uh, so hopefully everyone has a good email and they're able to receive those next week as well. So I'll look forward to uh, some responses when that comes out and I'll thank everyone. I'll no last minute questions. Alrighty. Well, I thank everyone for being here.
and I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Lots of information. I feel like I've rat a tat everything out to everybody, but I really want to squeeze as much as I can into your time. I'm thankful for everyone being here. So we'll see you again in the clinic. Take care.